Good morning. The honorary ambassador of China to Israel, the head of the insti institute. I was asked to speak in Hebrew, but have my presentation in English so that people who do not speak Hebrew could understand what I'm uh, talking about. You have to see the presentation. This is most important. You don't need to see me, says the speaker. Do we see Israel here on the map? Yes, but you need a magnifying glass to see Israel on this map. I decided to talk about something which is uh, different than other uh, topics because everybody is going to talk today about the bilateral relationship of Israel and China. I wanted to talk in this presentation about the role that China is filling in promoting the sh relationship of Israel with Asia. This is one of the most important things that happened in the past 25 years. Look at the map and you understand the importance of China, the centrality of China as far as uh, Asia is concerned. We're marking 25 years of the China-Israeli relations. And of course, I want to talk more about the implications of our relationship with China on the relationship with the rest of the Asian countries. And what I would like to talk about is first and foremost the um, disconnection we had until the beginning of the 1990s and later on talk about the circumstances that brought the change, which is the big breakthrough or the big leap in the 1990s that definitely turned everything dramatically and then talk about the implication of this dramatic change, the political implications, and I can tell you already it is relatively limited, the economic uh, implications and the military implications, and ultimately a few words about culture, breaking down the walls of ignorance of, no, of the lack of knowledge of Israel towards Asia and Asia towards Israel. First of all, I would like to talk about the relative uh, lack of contact, be contact between Israel when it was established in 1948 until 1990, maybe even 1991. Until then, Israel had relationship with only seven Asian countries. Uh, this is in the beginning of 1990. It is 42 years after Israel was established. And Israel is part of Asia. It is on the west of Asia, which we call the Middle East. But in China, they call it West Asia. So seven countries, and not the most important ones. There were countries here and there which were, were not always the central countries of Asia. And the relationship with those very countries were relationships that were very limited. Ultimately, when Israel was recognized by Asian countries, it took a lot of time until embassies were built, and then when they were embassies, they were not always headed by an embassy. Sometimes it was a proxy, sometimes it was a diplomatic ambassador which was not a resident and he would visit from time to time and it is the situation still in some countries. The Asian countries that did have relationship with Israel try to hide it in all sorts of ways. You're sure and uh, know it. Israel, Singapore for example, which developed very quickly, particularly in the 1960s, particularly in the military uh, aspect I need some help here, says the speaker with the computer. The Israelis who worked in Singapore were called Mexicans, so nobody knew that they, they were Israelis. When they were a relationship with a country like India, uh, they were always done 
in very remote areas, so nobody would know. Apart from that, several countries who ultimately wanted to have a relationship with Israel after uh, some, a few years, uh, particularly in the middle of the 90s, they uh, stopped this relationship, like Cambodia, like Vietnam, with whom Israel had a relationship for a short period of time. We usually tend to blame Asia for not having relationship between Israel and those countries. We always remind the fact that Asian countries are dependent on Arab oil, oil which limited their options. This dependency of several countries, particularly China and Taiwan, in UN votes regarding uh, including China in the UN or uh, expelling Taiwan, the connection with the former Soviet Union, after a disconnected relationship with Israel, it also affected other countries. Muslim co uh, large communities, we're going to see it on the map in Asia. Asia actually is the large focal point. We live here in the Middle East and we think that we are have most of the Muslim population in the Middle East, but actually the majority, three times more than in the Middle East, are the Muslim po uh, populations in Asia, and the four largest Muslim countries are in Asia. And we can also say a word about the anti-colonial uh, tradition that characterized Asia. And Israel was perceived as part of the West, as part of the European world in this respect. So it's easy to blame Asia. However, we cannot uh, avoid some blame ourselves. As far as Israel is concerned, we have to be very honest. Some is true for today. Asia was not so important to Israel. It was not so important. It was not on a high priority uh, as far as Israel was concerned. It was said earlier that between Israel and Asia, unlike Israel and Europe or Israel and the United States, Israel and Asia had a, a big gap, whether it was historical, cultural, uh, language-wise. The Asia countries do not uh, belong to the biblical uh, array. And one of the most important things is the scarcity of Jewish communities in Asia. Jewish communities were usually a very important basis until today for promoting relationship of Israel and uh, the international arena. Here you have some uh, figures and some information about the uh, distribution of Muslims in uh, the world. And you can see that over 1 billion Muslims live in Asia. And in the Middle East, we're talking about 300 million, a bit more than that. And it is making an influence to this day. And then a change came about. And I'm uh, going to divide this uh, change into two dimensions. The first dimension is the very obvious breakthrough, the big change. And here, within a very short period of time, I wrote here within a year, it was within a week or within even four days, there was an amazing turnaround of the relationship of Israel and Asia. And within a short period of time, this grew three times more than they were before that. And within one week, in January 1992, Israel stopped accessibility to almost half of the world population. It gained, uh, sorry, it gained access. And why did that happen? I think that two reasons uh, caused it. First of all, the collapse of the Soviet Union in the beginning of the 1990s allowed all Asian countries, including Mongolia, who was the first one that considered having relationship with Israel, but all of other Central Asian countries, and I am listing them here at the bottom, uh, they were encouraged to establish uh, relationships with Israel, and uh, everything changed. The second factor, the important factor for which we have convened here today, is the Chinese factor, the rise of China. In China, there was a big change from the end of the 1970s, the beginning of the 1980s, a change in priorities that I will talk about uh, later on. This changed the relationship towards Israel and enabled establishing relationships between Israel and China. China was 
uh, freed from its dependency on Arab Muslim uh, countries, the vote uh, for, uh, with the Arab Muslim countries in order to be accepted into the UN, the weight of the oil uh, balance also decreased and China found alternatives for the Middle East oil. Anyhow, there was a very clear distinction between oil and politics. There was a priority for economic development, which is perhaps the most important thing. It was talked about by the minister earlier and other speakers, uh, stressing economic development, stressing growth. And we could also end, add to this the steps that were done to promote peace in our area within the Israel and Egypt agreement in 1978, uh, establishing a Palestinian state, seemingly so, you might say, but in China, there is a representative of the in of Ch a Chinese representative in the Palestinian state. And we have a whole list of all countries, some with which relationships were established for the first time, and some with which Israel renewed the relationship because they were disconnected or put on hold, like Korea and all other uh, different other countries. And of course, there are those, for example, Singapore, where until today Singapore doesn't have an embassy in Israel. Although the ties are very much developed, there is a roaming ambassador that comes here often. The office that I won, he's in Israel. Er, years before, Israel tries to establish relationship with Taiwan, and Taiwan refused for the same reasons that I talked about earlier. But after we established relationships with China, Taiwan also wanted relationship with Israel. And this is the model that I'm talking about, the China's role. But except for this uh, very uh, um, overt breakthrough, there is a covert one, which is not seen, and I'll talk about some uh, figures later. There are several Asian countries, uh, all are Muslim countries, and they still uh, are not talking about any official contact with Israel. However, they enable, since the beginning of the 1990s and a bit uh, before that perhaps, they allow for non-official relations with the State of Israel, and it's a very important. I'm talking uh, particularly about uh, Pakistan, Indonesia, uh, Malaysia, Bangladesh to a certain extent. They are not only Muslim countries, but some are very hostile to Israel, uh, on the formal level, that is. Between Israel and these countries, there were relationships in various places of the world between heads of states. Uh, we still have cooperation uh, in the military field or intelligence cooperation. And the ambassador talked earlier about uh, the fight against terrorism. So uh, particularly working uh, with Pakistan, it exists even today. There are mutual visits. Sometimes they're being done very quietly. And the phenomenon of tourism particularly Islamic tourism to holy places. Uh, out of curiosity, I looked in the uh, Israel's uh, Statistic Bureau about the figures of tourism coming from these countries. You're not going to believe it. In the first four months of this year, of 2017, I didn't go back. We had 15,000 tourists from Indonesia visiting here. and. 2,900 from Malaysia. I had the honor and the privilege of visiting both these countries in the harsher times, but I myself was not aware of the fact uh, of the uh, regarding these figures. This is only four months. In addition, we have with these countries uh, different conferences, academic conferences, various meetings trade, and I'll show it later on, but only to give you some example, Israeli export to Malaysia, and Danny is here, he's shaking his head, in the year 2015, $1,420,000,000 dollars to Malaysia, a completely Muslim hostile country to Israel with no relationship uh, 
these numbers by themselves don't always make any meaning. I tell my students we have to put everything into perspective, into a comparative ratio. Is this a lot? This is the Israeli export to Germany. That's the scale here. So it is very interesting, definitely. Uh, well, uh, here I'd like to uh, talk about some political outcomes the military, the economic, and so forth. One of the main targets of Israel, since it was established in 1948, was to expand uh, the diplomatic relationships with countries of the world. And at least in the case of Asia, it turns out that the political implication of this step, which is very important for all sorts of different reasons, economic, cultural, military at times, the political implications was the least important of the ones of all other implications. And as was said uh, earlier, all of these countries, almost without exception, still out in the public and in their votes in various uh, uh, international um, forums, the UN and uh, the Human Rights uh, Council, constantly identify with the Palestinians. It was said that we want to see when there's going to be a Chinese veto on an anti-Israeli decision. No such thing happened. And I think that we will not see something like that happen until we get the Messiah comes. But in principle, the view and standpoint of all Asian countries, without exception, is that they vote against Israel or perhaps um, avoid any vote, but they never ever vote for Israel. There is a lot of excitement in Israel. The Prime Minister, for example, when there is such a vote, they immediately freeze relationship or they uh, talk to the ambassador. I think that we need to understand one thing. All the Asian countries, like all other countries of the world, they have their own interests, which uh, are is legitimate, of course. And as far as this is concerned, the Asian countries, if you look into it, the rates of voting is not different than any European countries or others uh, in the world. I see it as a means, almost the only single means of th those countries of voicing their support in the Palestinian issue or any other issues that Israel is involved in. For all sorts of reasons, whether it is Muslims who definitely support Arabs and uh, Palestinians or Western countries who support uh, principles of human rights and such. It's le completely legitimate. And I asked a Chinese friend of mine, how come you never vote ever for, the b for Israel? Why are you always against Israel? And he said, and the Chinese are so smart. I have been dealing with the Chinese for 50 years. He says, what difference does it make? It doesn't make any difference. It's not important. The international institutions where you get votes against Israel are impotent. It doesn't change reality at all. But for those countries, it is a means to voice their opinion. If Israel is harmed, it is harmed very minimally. And some of these countries told me, we know that if there is an anti-Israeli um, vote, uh, the United States is going to veto it ultimately, so nothing would happen. And by the way, no country, no Asian country ever volunteered to be a mediator in the Israeli-Palestinian conflict, uh, apart from a uh, mere declaration. We never saw anything real on the table, and I uh, presume we won't see. The second uh, aspect is the military aspect. It, this is very interesting. Some Asian countries bought uh, um, weapons with, technolo with Israeli technology even before there were relationships. Sometimes it's even sim more simple to do. Uh, India, Ceylon or Sri Lanka, Singapore, Thailand, Taiwan, and China, of course, all bought uh, weapons from Israel before or without having any diplomatic relationships between the countries, at times in very large quantities. In the 80s, 
Israel was perhaps the largest supplier of uh, weapon to China until the United States intervened, of course, and blocked this um, track within the 1990s until the beginning of the 2000s. Still, there is cooperation with China and with other countries relating security, uh, uh, for example, uh, fighting terrorism. Instead of China, India became the largest customer of uh, Israeli weapon in the world. And of course, other countries like Vietnam, we would have never imagined. And by the way, everything that I am saying now would not have been acceptable. We wouldn't have thought about it 30 years ago. This is all new developments. So between the years 1992 and 2016, for 24 years, the scope of sales to Asia tripled uh, if we compare it to 1950 to and 1991, which is a period of 41 years. And nowadays, uh, the arms export to Asia is about 50% of the total expert to the world. This is uh, uh, data that is conservative. Reality, I think, uh, exceeds uh, these numbers and figures. And here you have uh, some uh, numbers regarding the scope of the arms sales to Asia. You see that India is definitely leading uh, and this is what I said earlier as far as the comparison between the two periods of time. The matter of uh, economy is very important. Economy, that's uh, it, seemingly the main thing which exists. i just like to say a note. I heard Stuart Eisenstadt yesterday. He said in a meeting, that what is characteristic of the relationship between China and Israel is only the economic relationship. Unlike Israel and India, where there we have not only economic relationship, but also military and cultural and all sorts of other aspects. This, with all due respect, and Stuart Eisenstadt was the undersecretary of the United States. This is not true, simply not true and I'll talk about it uh, later on. One of the reasons for which we don't have military relationship is because of the United States. And cultural uh, relationships, uh, I would like to tell you that there are uh, elaborate cultural relationship between Israel and China compared to Israel and India. And one of the Im most important things is that China always showed interest in the Israeli culture, it was ready to build sectors for the research of Israel, the research of Judaism, classes for Hebrew and such. You know, the Indians are not interested. They really don't want, and it's very e difficult to do things with them. Let's go back to the economy. Until the 90s, uh, the weight of Israeli economy was very negligible. And as you can see here in the table, 97% of the import, and by 2016, it's more than 35. 1990, 16% of export, and now we're talking about 26% in 2016. And China, of course, is uh, the uh, great thing today in trade as well. And here I do a small exercise. I put China and Hong Kong together because Hong Kong is part of China. It is. All those uh, that uh, the data of trade are completely different. And if we add Hong Kong, then the picture changes altogether. Not just the scope of trade uh, with Israel, but uh, also as far as the balance and I'll show it in a second, the gap between uh, import and export in China is an engine. 
an engine that uh, the moment China is in the picture, of course, other countries ask themselves, maybe we should also get into the picture, maybe she would also expand our activities, and then everything expands as, as a result of that in agriculture, in construction, in many other things, and you can see the data. The, the six countries that are leading with the Israeli trade with Asia in the last few years, you see the list, China, Hong Kong together are the ones that are very significant, much larger than all the other countries. And then later on, we have countries that maybe, uh, you know, India, uh, okay, Vietnam all of a sudden becomes a factor as far as Israel's export, even before Japan, and Malaysia as well is in the picture, and if you could see the bottom line, and you look actually in 2015, there was a, a surplus of export. Is that correct? I don't want to intervene, but there's a bias here. If we talk about Malaysia, it's only one company, one company that deals with uh, Israel, Intel, and therefore, it's sort of, uh, it's, a very, it's a very small fragment of Malaysia. If you go into details, it's, then it doesn't look that way. Uh, I, still, but look, Malaysia is still a Muslim country where we, one, Malaysia wanted Ilta to come and establish a plan. They said, no problem but the spare parts will come from Israel. And they said, we don't want it. So Intel said, then we're not gonna build our plan there. And then they said, okay. So this is an example that it's not that Malaysia volunteered to start a relationship with Israel. It's a bit different. Look, it's all question of interest. Nobody, of course, uh, says otherwise. And I uh, want to conclude and talk about the culture. Look, until the beginning of the 90s, until the beginning of the 90s, I call it a mutual ignorance, Asia to Israel and Israel to Asia. I checked at the time the curriculum in school, what's happening in the education, uh, in the Ministry of Education, and nobody dealt with anything that had to do with Asia or China. Uh, well, they spoke about at the time of uh, various things, but Asia was never studied in our schools here. And, uh, 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 you know, people only knew songs, maybe, uh, little songs about the Chinese people, uh, songs from German that was translated to Hebrew. People didn't know anything about China. They, uh, nobody knew anything about it, and that was it. 1968, uh, 69 was the first time there was a department in the Hebrew University that started teaching Asian studies. Since the 90s, there's a big revolution, a whole turnover regarding Asia. Three departments in other de uh, universities in Israel teaching Asian studies and in China, and not only there, there were department and uh, research institutes that dealt with Judaism and Israel, and uh, hundreds of books that were translated to the various languages, and exhibitions, and performances, and concerts, and theater, uh, sports, whatever you can think of, uh, international conferences. And uh, the last uh, examples and the role of China is uh, tourism and uh, airlines. You know, until recently, the only El Al flew to these countries, but the moment that uh, Korean airlines uh, uh, came back, uh, went back, but the moment that the Hainan, the Chinese airline, started flying to Israel, all of a sudden we see that uh, uh, India, Cathay Pacific, and all the Singapore airlines also started flying here. To conclude, look, there's no question that there was a real dramatic breakthrough to Asia in the beginning of the 90s. 
maybe uh, after 48, after the State of Israel was established, there was like, uh, there was no such breakthrough as it was in the 90s. So what's interesting about it? If you remember, I told you about all the barriers, all the blocks, all the problems uh, before the 90s. I spoke about oil, uh, Islam, uh, the Israeli Arab conflict. All these three barriers exist until this very day. They continue to exist, even more so. Today, the Asian countries are more dependent on the Arab oil uh, from the uh, Persian Gulf than before. And Muslim populations in uh, Asia are more than they were before. The Israeli-Arab-Palestine conflict is stuck. It wasn't solved. I remember in the 80s, the Chinese uh, made conditions that said we're going to establish relations in, with Israel. If there'll be a Palestinian state with the capital Jerusalem, Israel will withdraw from all their territories and stop its aggressive policy. These were the three conditions. 1992, the relations were established. Today it's 2017. No withdrawal from all their territories. Jerusalem for the moment is just the capital of Israel and uh, uh, aggressiveness you can discuss. Nothing has changed, and nevertheless, all these countries established relations with Israel. What's the focus of all this? What's the lesson that we can learn as far as, far as the Chinese? What is important for them? The most important thing is the focus on economy, economic development, uh, growth, race of quality of life and a detachment between that and the other political barriers. It doesn't mean that the Asian countries ignore the problems that are in the Middle East, Palestinians and other problems, but since when uh, sometimes we have a block in the way, one thing is to get away, to do away with it. But if you can't, you circumvent, you bypass the barriers and that's what uh, they did. China, I think, is a very interesting thing. I think many countries in Asia waited for China to make the first step. And the moment they took the step, the other countries came along. But that doesn't end with diplomatic relations. It continues all the time. There's a step by step. We're talking about economy and various fields. Other countries also joined and uh, tried to emulate China. And I think uh, of course, there's discussion is about the Chinese economy, whether it's 6.9 percent or 6.5 percent or whatever. It makes no difference. China is going to continue to be a very significant force in the future, and it will have an impact on the relations between Asia and Israel. Thank you very much. Thank you, Professor.